All right, everyone, I'm going to do a brief introduction before we get going. Um, I always figure that at Institute events, um, my remarks are sometimes more or less expendable to begin with um, because people really want to get all onto the exciting part of the, uh, the exciting part of the afternoon. My name is Mark Canuel. I'm director of the Institute for the Humanities at UIC. Thank you to our co-sponsors for this event, Black Studies and Global Asian Studies. We all welcome you to our discussion of critical race theory now, and we hope you'll join us at other exciting Institute events coming up. Next week on April 13th at 5.30, we're going to have a really wonderful conversation between Luis Alfaro and Luis Urea. Um, you can register for this event by coming to our website. Um, and we hope that you'll also come to join us for our visiting fellow events on April 26th and April 27th with Gerald Horn, a leading scholar in modern, early modern and colonial American history and black history. Um, the now in our title today, Critical Race Theory Now is crucial because critical race theory has been with us for a long time and part of our own work, but lately, um, unless you have been truly not watching the news at all, um, it has become a big part of the national conversation um, as recently as the confirmation hearings for Katanji Brown Jackson. Our panel today is one way for us as a community to discuss perceptions and misperceptions, talking about our real relation to critical race theory and discussing the ways that campuses can and do participate in and shape a wider conversation. I'd like to thank um, so sincerely all of our participants, Joseph Jewell, Russell Contreras, Anu Guevara, Terry McMurdy Chubb, and David Stovall, who have graciously agreed to share their thought and expertise with us today. I want to remind our audience that we're, we are welcoming discussion um, and we hope you'll participate. Um, but we also do privilege respect, consideration, and care in our communications, and we expect this from everyone in our room. Those who would like to speak can use the hand raise function um, after that is after the, our remarks and we get some questions opened up. Or you can ask a question in the chat and we'll do our best to address what comes in. I'm uh, in shortly going to hand the mic over to Professor Joseph Jewell, who will be moderating the panel. Professor Jewell is Professor of Sociology and Black Studies and is Head of Black Studies at UIC. His work uses comparative and historical approaches to the study of inequality that stress the inseparability of race, class, and gender. He's particularly interested in class formations in the African diaspora. His work has been concerned with cultural and legal responses to social mo mobility among racial minorities, and he's produced books and articles, including Race, Social Reform, and the Making of the Middle Class, the American Missionary Association in Black Atlanta, 1870 to 1900, Mixing Bodies and Minds, Race, Class, and Mixed Schooling Controversies in Atlanta and New Orleans, 1874 to 1887, and Othering People's Children, Social Mothering, Schooling, and Race in Late 19th Century New Orleans and San Francisco. He's currently working on a book project that examines how racial narratives about middle-class mobility were used to sustain or alter regional racial hierarchies in the US during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. He currently serves on the editorial board of Social Science History. Thank you so much, Joseph. I will hand the mic to you. Thank you, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'd like to uh, take a moment and introduce uh, our, our wonderful panelists uh, that we um, have with us today. Um, so first is uh, Russell Contreras. Uh, Mr. Contreras is a uh, race and justice reporter at Axios, uh, covering the policies and agencies at the heart of the administration of justice uh, and how uh, it impacts people of color. Uh, he received his BA in English and history from the University of Houston, 
uh, another Texas person, um, and his uh, MFA from Columbia before working at Axios. Uh, he wrote for 12 years at the Associated Press where he covered immigration, uh, issues around Latino civil rights, racial conflict in the American Southwest, and the legacy of slavery and racial segregation in modern politics. He's also worked as a reporter for the Boston Globe uh, and the uh, Albuquerque Journal. Our next panelist is uh, Professor Ana Guevara. Uh, she is the founding director of the Global Asian Studies Program and a co-PI of the UIC Ana PC Initiative. Uh, she is the co-PI of the Social Justice and Human Rights Cluster uh, and a member of the Diaspora Cluster at UIC. She stays very busy. <laughs> Professor Guevara's scholarly, creative, and teaching interests focus on immigrant and transnational labor, uh, the geopolitics of care work, critical diaspora studies, and community engagement as they relate to dynamics of race, gender, and empire. Uh, she's the author of the award-winning book, Marketing Dreams and Manufacturing Heroes, The Transnational Labor Brokering of Filipino Workers. She's currently working on three projects. One explores, exam uh, one, uh, excuse me, uh, examines the racialized and gender dynamics of robotic innovation uh, and the labor of care work in the context of neoliberal globalization. Uh, two further projects in collaboration with Professor Gayatri Reddy focus on mapping the multiracial histories and solidarity work in response to urban renewal policies that have displaced communities in Uptown, uh, a north side uh, neighborhood in Chicago, and exploring relationships among diaspora, empire, and global local foodways. We're also joined by Terry McMurtry Chubb. Is a professor of law and associate dean for research and faculty development at UIC Law. She researches, teaches, and writes in the areas of critical rhetoric, discourse, and genre analysis, critical race feminism, and legal history. Uh, Dr. McMurtry Chubb is a leader in designing curricula to facilitate diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. She's the author of over 30 publications, including the books Race Unequals, Overseer Contracts, White Masculinities, and the Formation of Managerial Identity in the Plantation Economy. Um, I just heard a, uh, uh, her give a brief talk about uh, her book, and it's quite fascinating. Um, and I'm sorry, and strategies for techniques for integrating diversity, equity, and inclusion into the core law curriculum. Uh, she's also contributor to Feminist Judgments, Rewritten Opinions of the United States Supreme Court. And in 2019, she was awarded the 2018 uh, Teresa Godwin uh, Phelps Award for Scholarship in Legal Communication uh, for her article, The Rhetoric of Race, Redemption and Will Contests, Inheritance as Reparations in John Grisham's Sycamore Row. Uh, she's the recipient of the uh, 2021 Thomas F. Blackwell Memorial Award for outstanding achievement in the field of legal writing. And uh, important to note, she's the first person of color and first black woman to achieve this honor. And we're also joined by Professor David Stovall, uh, one of my colleagues in black studies, uh, who's um, also in uh, criminology, law and justice uh, here at UIC. Uh, his scholarship investigates three areas, critical race theory, uh, the relationship between housing and education, uh, and the intersection of race, place, and school. Uh, so in an attempt to bring theory to action, he works with community organizations and schools to address issues of equity, justice, and, excuse me, abolishing the school prison nexus. His work led him to become a member of the design team for the Greater Lawndale Little Village School for Social Justice, uh, which opened in the fall of 2005. Uh, and so furthering his work with these communities, students and teachers, his work manifests itself um, in his involvement with the People's Education Movement, which is a collection of classroom teachers, community members, students and university professors in Chicago, Los Angeles and the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, all of whom engage in uh, collaborative community projects that are centered on creating relevant curriculum. So in addition to his duties and responsibilities as a professor at UIC, see we all stay so busy, 
He also served as a volunteer social studies teacher at the Greater Lawndale Little Village School for Social Justice uh, from 2005 to 2018. Uh, he's the author of Born Out of Struggle, Critical Race Theory, School Creation, and the Politics of Interruption, as well as numerous articles and chapters on race, schools, and urban politics. And his newest book, Engineered Conflict, School Closings, Public Housing, Law Enforcement, and the Future of Black Life, received support from an Institute for, uh, for the Humanities Faculty Fellowship and is due out from Haymarket Press in 2023. So we've got a powerhouse panel and I hope you all are ready for it. Okay. So I thought what we uh, do is start by um, uh, giving each of our panelists a chance to talk a little bit about how critical race theory uh, is a part of their work. And I guess we'll start with uh, uh, Russell, Russell Contreras, please. Yes, thanks for having me and thank you to the university for this opportunity. So for about a year, I've been covering what we would call the backlash and the movement to limit discussion about race and diversity in education. And I say, the, I put it that way because it's under the guise of, quote, banning critical race theory. What we know is that a group called the C Citizens for Renewing America, a group led by a former uh, White House budget director under President Trump, started this movement, uh, what it appears to be after focus groups effort. We're trying to find out what would, what issue would excite conservative parents. And this is the issue they landed on. This organization posts what they call model legislation for states and school boards to uh, introduce and pass. And what the legislation does, it's broadly written, and it says just to limit the discussion of, edu of uh, diversity education. If it uh, makes a student of one race feels guilty about his or her race. Uh, obviously, this is directed towards white students who are feel guilty if we're having a discussion about systemic racism. So under that guise, under that movement, we've seen um, examples across the country where parents have challenged school boards, but also challenged educators, threatened them, threatened superintendents, teachers. And so it follows also this anti-mask, anti- -mask, anti um, vaccination uh, efforts in schools that they're couched on an effort uh, for parents' rights. So that's the environment which I've come from in covering this. But as a reporter, this also comes as our newsrooms are having a reckoning about our diversity and our makeup in the news media. This reinforces where we are in fostering stereotypes and discussing race and discussing uh, aspects of LGBT, LGBTQ people everything across the board. And what I found, and I feel very honored to be working at Axios, a company that has told me, cover this aggressively, we got your back. Journalists, usually journalists of color, are, have, don't have that privilege. And we're also faced with critical race journalism, which we face in our own newsrooms. And what I mean by that is those who decide to cover these issues, if you're a journalist of color, you're more than likely also speaking out against um, the lack of black or brown voices in your newsroom. So you're already a pariah because you're challenging the systemic structures of your newsroom. So when you cover an issue like this and you get a backlash of folks saying this person's not fair, uh, they're, they're alleging uh, that we need to be covering W. E. Du Bois because he know W. E. Du Bois was a communist and he, he died and he turned his back in Ghana or something. Then the editors were like, well, this is my chance to get rid of that troublemaker or, or put pressure on them because he challenged me about our lack of coverage and another issue there. So in many ways, the journalists, especially the journalists of color, are fighting a two-front war. Cover the issue as just and fairly and as accurate as possible, but also doing it also in the newsroom. What this is, what I found, and it's, it's I, hard for me to articulate it, but we are finding ourselves trying to cover the legacy of white supremacy and also fighting it within our own spaces. And this is, I think, what all journalists do uh, when they're facing and when they want to cover this um, accurately, but also more importantly, and we'll talk about this, actually know what we're covering and understand it. All right, thank you. All right, Professor uh, Guevara. 
Thanks very much, Professor Jewell. Um, I just wanted to say thank you again to uh, Mark and Linda for this invitation. And also um, it's an honor to be with, among with my esteemed colleagues and comrades and to be in conversation with all of you. Um, before I begin, I just want to acknowledge that I am coming from you from the University of Illinois at Chicago, which is on the occupied territories that belong to the traditional territories of the three fire peoples, the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi. And I am grateful for the privilege of being able to speak. So when uh, Mark invited me to uh, present on this panel, I was, um, you know, I was really excited, but I also needed to think a little bit about what I wanted to say. And I wanted to foreground a couple of points, um, specifically from my location as an ethnic studies scholar, specifically an Asian American studies scholar, and also one who has dedicated much of you know, my career to building and sustaining ethnic studies programs. So one point I wanted to highlight is that um, for us to, to see how the movement towards building ethnic studies is in conversation with critical race theory, with the attacks against CRT mirroring in some ways or in many ways, the attacks on ethnic studies. And then two, to also highlight uh, recent legislation in Illinois, which is the Illinois Teaching Equitable Asian American Community History Act or TEACH Act, and explore the ways in which the CRT framework has been crucial to, or is crucial to its effective implementation. So I wanted to just give um, just quick background or summary. Uh, I know that many of you know this already, that the birth of ethnic studies is credited to the 1968 uprising in San Francisco that operated under what's called the Third World Liberation Front or TWLF. And this was a coalition led by Black Student Union alongside Mexicans, Filipinos, Chinese, Arab American, and Native American students who led a five month strike at San Francisco State University to specifically demand a radical shift in admissions practices that excluded non-white students and also to demand a shift in the curriculum that they regarded as not speaking to the lives of students of color. So not only did they demand a culturally relevant education and accountability from educational institutions, they also promoted a form of new world consciousness modeled on ideologies of self-determination rather than a shallow and hollow conceptions of diversity and multiculturalism. So critical legal scholars who we know like Mari Matsuda was part of the organizing committee for the first conference of, on CRT at the University of Wisconsin in Madison in 1989. And she came out of this TWLF movement. And as many of you know, at the core of this movement are the central tenets of CRT. To understand slavery and segregation as central to the US higher, racial hierarchy, to understand white supremacy as fundamental to the power structures that govern our you know, US society, to emphasize lived experience um, as critical to the lives of minoritized communities and to understand that these experiences are intersectional. So if we fast forward many years, much like the backlash against CRT right now, ethnic studies programs in the last decade or so have been and continue to be under attack in the public realm. And if they exist at universities, they are often underfunded and at times have been defunded. And we see this in Arizona with the defunding of Mexican American studies. We see this with the hunger strikes initiated at UC Irvine in California or Northwestern University in Chicago, who were, you know, with students um, fed up with the absence of ethnic studies programs. And in most cases, um, when we see ethnic studies programs, they have always, um, I mean, most often been a product of grassroots movements. And this is certainly the case with the interdisciplinary programs at UIC, where, for example, Latin American and Latino studies um, began as a movement in 1971, spearheaded by a group of students who were part of the Organization of Latin American Students, or OLAS, or the Circle Women's Liberation Union that agitated to bring gender and women's studies into existence, also in the 70s. And for my program, the Global Asian Studies Program, which is the youngest of the interdisciplinary programs, our program also took 20 years to build and another 12 to grow into a major. So, and that was also a product of student agitation. 
And so as these uh, programs are established, their value and utility for the university is often challenged, as many of you know. And the way I see it, it's not only crucial to emphasize the importance of culturally relevant curriculum, but I also think that it's important to resist the twin frames of liberal multi multiculturalism and heritage education, which unfortunately governs a lot of um, um, the support for ethnic studies programs. And I would argue that, you know, instead CRT, intersectional feminism, abolition, anti-capitalist and decolonizing frameworks are really key for understanding critical identity and community formations. And unfortunately we see uh, some of these tensions play out in California where the critical edge of the ethnic studies model school curriculum that was passed became a disservice to the ethnic studies fields, ideological and political foundation because it removed discussions of capitalism, Islamophobia, and settler colonialism. Which brings me to um, just my second point, and that is to, you know, how, how do we think about the passage of the TEACH Act or the Teaching Equitable Asian American Community History Act? Um, this is um, a legislation that was passed in July, which makes Illinois the first state to mandate the teaching of Asian American history in K through 12, through an inclusion of a curricular unit in Asian American history. And you know, this you know, is a legislation that um, is important for many communities, I mean, especially the Asian American community, because again, it, it is reaffirming that lived experiences matter, that the communities in which Asian American students are part of, you know, that that matters. It highlights the diversity of experiences for this community. And it's also a way um, that is, you know, it is uplifting the importance of reframing the narrative of exceptionalism that is often used to articulate uh, the representations of Asian Americans. But the challenge that we face now is how to implement it. One challenge is at the level of structural support for teachers who are supposed to deliver this curriculum in the absence of any financial support from the state. And another challenge is in terms of the framing of this history. So while the state is very insistent on insisting a frame that emphasizes liberal multiculturalism and heritage education, alongside emphasizing the economic contributions of Asian Americans, you know, there is a need, a great need to intervene in those discussions and to insist that we center CRT, um, intersectional feminism, and abolition frameworks for understanding Asian American experiences. And again, resisting what happened with the ethnic studies model curriculum in California, which abandoned these critical frameworks. And you know, I can talk more about that, but I wanted to highlight that because that is um, you know, one, of the, um, one of the challenges that we are facing uh, with regards to this particular legislation. And so I just, you know, I want to end and just um, kind of return to, to Mari Matsuda, who I mentioned earlier, um, who has been a fierce defender of CRT. And I return to her words because it's often a, a reminder of why CRT is important, especially in a climate where we are often asked to defend it. And these are her words at a keynote that she delivered in 1989 at a conference in Madison. In her address, she asks, what is critical race theory? And she provides her or these answers. It is the deconstruction of liberal legal ideology using texts written in blood by our ancestors. It is the refusal ever to ignore harm to human bodies. It is the elevation of poets and unclothing of liars. It is theory with an end called liberation. So with that, I will just end there. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Guevara. Right. And uh, Professor uh, McMurtry Tug. Thank you so much. Thanks to Mark and Linda for this invitation. And Dr. Joel, thank you for all that you do. And uh, so wonderful to be here with, with all of my wonderful colleagues, UICY. So I wanted to start with just um, I am a, a second generation critical race theory, critical race feminism scholar in the law school context where um, critical race theory kind of took root and was born. Um, 
And that's significant in that, you know, it was taught by the, the founding uh, people in the movement, um, but find myself in a quite an interesting situation where we think about what uh, Dr. Guevara just told us uh, and use the wonderful words of Mari Matsuda that uh, law schools are the place where we preserve the hierarchy and inequities of our nation, <laughs> right? Because we say we are a nation of laws and not men, but law is the protector of capitalism. Law is a protector of neoliberalism. It's in the law where we protect these things. So being in a law school, teaching students how to deconstruct that is undermining their very existence as lawyers or how they function in American democracy. So it's important to understand that, uh, which is why there's such a horrible backlash against critical race uh, theory and critical race feminism. The second thing is that I find myself in a very curious position because for the last, you know, probably four years and two years in, in haste, um, I've been traveling to law schools around the country to teach professors how to integrate diversity, equity, and inclusion into the curriculum at American law schools and how to integrate anti-racism if they want to go even further into the law school curriculum. In haste, because in the summer of 2020, law students were having a, I would say, a nascent uh, ethnic studies moment, um, not quite on the scale of the Third World Liberation Front and Black Studies at, at um, San Francisco State and uh, the Berkeley students, <laughs> um, but demanding in the wake of George Florida, it, Floyd and Amar Aubrey and Breonna Taylor that we do better in legal academia with educating them about how the law functions to perpetuate inequity. Um, and again, this is not the norm at American law schools. We are not teaching students how to be revolutionaries. We are not teaching students how to, and I use that term with the greatest of respect, right? Not as an off, like, oh, we're not teaching them to be revolutionaries, but it's important to understand that American law enshrines the inequities that we rail against, right? So legal education historically has not been about undermining those things. And sadly, when law students come to law school and they think I'm going to be a, law, a social justice warrior and I'm going to be um, a, a, a warrior for justice, often, most of the time, uh, it is beaten out of them within the first year and they don't get it back, which I, I say that with, uh, a broken heart. So in traveling around the country, um, I've noticed several things. One is that there are now 25 states with legislation. I think half of those states now have passed the legislation into law that's anti-CRT legislation. A lot of this legislation is centered in K through 12, but there are states that are now enacted. The legislation is going further into higher ed. What does this mean? Well, when I go give workshops to law professors, they, they are navigating the laws of their particular state and what they can say. So, you know, for instance, uh, two examples come immediately to mind, and I'll, I'll just read some of this legislation for you. So in Georgia, uh, Georgia has a particularly, I, I think it's one of the, the more nefarious anti-CRT uh, pieces of legislation, and it says this. Uh, slavery, racial discrimination under the law, and racism in general are so inconsistent with the founding principles of the United States that Americans fought a civil war to eliminate the first, waged long, long-standing political campaigns to eradicate the second, and rendered the third unacceptable in the court of public opinion. Now, this is laughable, right, given that Georgia has just passed one of the most virulently racist voter suppression laws in the country, right, um, for it to have this framing, and that the governor signed this law in, in closed chambers under a picture of a Southern plantation with an all-white audience, right? So this is, it, it's like, it's crazy making. And then in Tennessee, uh, the legislature has actually started a teacher liability fund uh, to to help teachers to fight legal legal battles because students, it, but the legislature also created a cause of action 
for students to sue their professors if they feel like they are teaching them divisive concepts, right? So I have colleagues in this state who, you know, one just called me the other day and said, hey, you know, I'm teaching in my, my law class and I'm wondering, like, can I say this? And if I do say it, if someone sues me, yeah, the, the, the state might, because she works for uh, University of Tennessee, the state might uh, uh, defend me, <laughs> but I still have to go through this lawsuit. My name is still going to be drugged through the mud. And at the end of the day, you created a cause of action for students to sue me for teaching divisive concepts. Concepts. I just had a, I was talking to a colleague from North Dakota this morning, and she said she was in her class. She teaches a class on um, library technology. And she said, this is a very dry class. And in the middle of the class, I'm, I'm talking about how there are, you know, various identities that might intersect to um, uh, to prevent people from having access to technology. And in the middle of like holding up my marker at the whiteboard, I thought, oh, no, like, have I just talked about intersectionality, which is on the prohibited list, right? <laughs> so this is a very real and present fear for professors, not only at the law school level, um, but, you know, but in higher ed, as we're beginning to see more lawsuits, I talked to a colleague, actually one of my mentors who said, hey, I don't know if I'm going to be able to teach my critical race feminism class in the fall um, because the legislature in my state uh, has made critical race theory untouchable. Like I can't teach it. Right. And so this this kind of instability that people are feeling. So now I am in the position of teaching the, the teachers, if you will, like how do I navigate this and be true to the pledges that we made to students in 2020 um, when we said to them that Black Lives Matter, when we said to them that we were gonna work hard to, to integrate um, issues of difference into the curriculum. And how am I going to do that now when I have this legal specter um, in the background at telling me as a law professor that I may not be able to teach these things. Um, so, so this is huge. Also, I wanted to bring your attention to, uh, there are quite a, well, the Citizens for Renewing America that Russell mentioned, they have out one of the most popular anti-CRT toolkits. So we, what we're seeing is uh, grassroots conservative organizations uh, putting out these anti-CRT toolkits for parents to use in their community. So some of these have like templates for emails that you write and templates for like PTA meetings, right? The one from Citizens for Renewing America is called Combating Critical Race Theory in Your Community, an A to Z guide on how to stop critical race theory and reclaim your local school board. Um, the Manhattan Institute also has an anti-CRT toolkit out as does Prager USA. Um, so these are just a few, you know, a, a few things, a few toolkits, if you will, <laughs> that are being like used nationwide. Um, and we see, you know, the template being created with South Lake in Texas, right? Um, these successful school board fights, litigation, removing the school board that is, you know, troubling, um, trying to bring in these concepts uh, of, of equity and equality. So I'll just end with, you know, us thinking about like, what does this look like? First of all, what kind of students will we be getting, right? from other states to come into our classrooms and engage uh, with us about uh, issues of difference. Uh, if they're coming from school districts where this wasn't, where we weren't able to do this. The, the second thing I, I wanna talk about in closing is that a lot of this legislation is being churned out by conservative legislative think tanks that their only job is to turn out this legislation. If you look at the legislation, a lot of it has similar wording and that's by design because they're being churned out by the same legislative mills, right? And think tanks that they're just think they, they have thought this up um, and are thinking about, as Russell said, like this is a hot button issue for that's gonna ignite voters. And so we're gonna make sure we flood states with as much legislation as we possibly can. And the third thing is understanding that Law professors, law students are in a precarious position in terms of, you know, being, quote unquote, true to what American legal education is and being subversive to what legal education is. Critical race theory has always been under fire at American law schools. Critical race scholars have always been maligned um, and marginal in legal education. Um, it was not like we were not taking over legal education. Right. But at this point, 
getting the courses to teach our students how to have a critique of their legal education, we're getting pushback not only from the legislature, we're getting pushback from law schools themselves with people who want to preserve the status quo and pushback from uh, students who don't think that a critical view of the law has any part of the law. So I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you. And Professor Stovall. Indeed. Thanks so much, Dr. Joel. And thanks to Mark and uh, Linda for contacting me as somebody to participate in this good to be here with the comrades. Uh, I won't repeat what my fellow panelists have said, but just will start with a quote from a psychologist by the name of Neely Fuller. And it's a piece that I always use in my classes when engaging CRT. The quote is, if you do not understand white supremacy, everything else will confuse you. And I think that becomes critically important when we talk about something like CRT, because to Dr. McMurtry Chubb's point, what groups like Citizens for Renewing America and, and Turning Point USA are supposedly fighting against is not critical race theory, right? They mess up the, they mess up the theoretical points. You know, they're still talking about the Frankfurt School. They're still talking about Marcuse. They're still talking about uh, other folks who were not part of the critical race theory movement centered in the Madison Conference of 1989. They are not having conversations about Derrick Bell. They may breach spaces around intersectionality, but the conversation is not actually about CRT. My work actually is connected to a subfield of critical race theory called critical race praxis that comes from a legal scholar by the name of Eric Yamamoto. And what Eric Yamamoto says, I think is critically important. He says we need to spend less time with abstract theorizing and more time on the ground with people who are experiencing injustice because at any time, those people could be us. And if I operate with the understanding that at any given time, those people could be us, now I have to ask a different question of my work. And critical race theory is putting me, pushing me to say, if we know that we live in a space that is founded on white supremacy, genocide, enslavement, and wrongful land appropriation, then what is the work moving forward? These aren't points of admonition. These are the facts. These are the facts according to the Constitution. So now, if we operate from those premises, what does it mean to do our work? And I'll use these four components to kind of situate where I'm approaching these things because I'm not trying to be confused about white supremacy, but I want to be clear in terms of how I navigate it and attack it. So now when we think about something like a critical race practice and practice just meaning action and reflection in the world in order to change it, the first thing that comes up is the concept or what Eric Yamamoto would call the conceptual, right? So what is it, what work are you trying to do, right? If you're trying to get legislation passed around teaching ethnic studies, if you're trying to engage work in K-12 classroom spaces, what is the work that you're trying to do? So you need to think about your work conceptually. The second component is the material. What are the resources that you need to do your work and to make your work possible, right? So it is a material question that is asking you to engage some work. The third component is the performative. So now that you have come up with your concept, now that you have your resources, what is the actual work that you're doing, right? How do you approach it? How do you implement it? How are you looking at it to improve it? What did not go well? So now, that performative moment is actually saying, here is the work that you are doing. The fourth component is the reflexive, which is the most important, because now you're saying, okay, this work has been done. Now, what did not go well? What did go well? And now what are we willing to do to improve it? So in this particular moment, the attacks are not a surprise. In the summer of 2020, Mainstream white populations had to come to grips with the place that they hold so dear almost got burnt to the ground and it was nothing that they could do. So now 
in that response to see that it never happens again. The first space of frontal attack is K-12 school space to eliminate any conversation around the founding of the United States, around what the place, this place is, has come to be, and the laws that govern it that have systemically positioned people in particular ways, some being valued and others being devalued. So now, if we think about that moment, what does it mean to navigate that space and at the same time be clear that the work moving forward is one, to recognize what it is that we're in, two, to join forces with people who also understand what it is that we're in, and then three, be willing to fight and be brave when it comes time to name white supremacy for what it is. And I think we have to, when we are clear about that, then our work becomes different and we are able to see other allies who are also doing this work. And my concern is everybody got, everybody got relaxed for a little bit and forgot that white supremacy is still here. And you got a president that told you he was a moderate, he was a moderate pragmatist in Barack Obama, but you didn't believe him, right? And then you get the recoil in Donald Trump, which is just returning you to understand what the United States has always been, a land founded on slavery, genocide, and wrongful land appropriation in the form of settler colonialism. And now, past the summer of 2020, when folks said that we've had enough, there is the backlash to now prevent any of those conversations raising up in the places where questions come the most. But again, we've been here before. A bunch of our K-12 schooling system is rarely about educating folks. And the fight has always been, can you get it to a space where it is about educating folks? And we are still in that struggle. And I think it becomes important to recognize that the CRT moment where we see this backlash is part of a larger historical relationship that we need to constantly be in recognition of because we have seen this before and we will see it again. Now the question becomes, what are you willing to do because you know these things to be real, apparent, and true? So I'll stop there. Thank y'all. I did not want to uh, repeat and wanted to keep it as brief as I can. Thank y'all. Thank you. All right. So I'd like to start with uh, a question that I think some of us have kind of touched on, and I'm going to show my hand a little bit as a, uh, 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 as a comparative historical sociologist and, and, and ask, um, thinking about the title of, of today's panel, about critical race theory now, and I guess that's part of the question is, you know, why now? You know, what is it about this present historical moment that has given these attacks on, on, on not just CRT, but the ideals of, of, of critical thinking about our, 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 our institution, our civic and social institutions? What's, what's given them such urgency? And, and how, uh, how do you... Uh, how do we address this in our work? I would bring up that right now it, it's important to um, document what's going on in the country, how we're changing. Currently right now, our K-12 student population is around 49 to 50% students of color. That's it's the most diverse we've been. We're also the most segregated we've been. There's this weird dichotomy that's going on. We're coming more diverse, but we're becoming more segregated. And what's happening is that Black and Latino students are being placed in institutions together. At the same time, our educator population is more, more diverse, but it's not keeping up with this vast demographic transformation. So about maybe 25 to 30% of educators are people of color. So there is a pressure that school districts are facing to come up with curriculum that is reflective of the students they seek to teach. So while we're having this debate about critical race theory, Schools right now, we're struggling before this movement just to get basic material in there. No, they weren't bringing up Derek Bell or um, any of the Margaret Montoya or any of the other critical race theories, uh, Richard Delgado. They were just barely getting in James Baldwin if we were lucky. 
or getting a piece of the uh, letters from a Birmingham jail. The structure of, of diversity education um, was mainly centered on the black experience, very limited. We know that slavery occurred. We know that there was a civil war, then Jim Crow, then the civil rights movement. And the civil rights movement, you may dedicate a week and you'll learn that Martin Luther, Ka Martin Luther King had a dream. He asked how long, and then he went to the mountaintop with maybe Malcolm and Rosa Parks thrown in there in the middle. And that's it. But in terms of Latino history, you may get a mention of Cesar Chavez and Asian American history. You're just going to get the Japanese internment camp and the railroads. That's it. So when we talk about um, banning critical race theory in K through 12, we're not talking about removing theoretical framework. We're talking about removing that basic history and a, an attempt to return to consensus history, where history is there to reinforce nationalism. It's there to reinforce a narrative that one that really came out of the Cold War after we had defectors in, in the Korean War to say that this is a country that you should be proud of and here are the positive things. If you're injecting slavery or anything else, you're doing the same thing to discredit us just as the Korean communists, the North Korean communists. It's the same thing, except the words have changed. So I just want to reinforce that, yes, critical race theory is facing a backlash in the academy, but the K through 12, amongst everybody else, it's more simple. It's not us discussing that Tulsa happened and put it in context. It's just saying that it happened. Just mentioning it is the battle right now. Thank you. Others? I just keep thinking of when uh, Barack Obama hugged Derek Bell. Do you all remember that? Uh, there was there was a, a image of him hugging Derek Bell when he was a student and everybody went crazy. <laughs> and I think that, you know, that moment, it's kind of like, you know, I, I think about, um, you know, the 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 birther movement and people saying, oh, you know, that's just this one off crazy billionaire guy. Right. <laughs> Um, and I think, you know, now we've come back around to like, oh, that's just so scary. Co of course it has to be scary. So what, and it's, what's the scariest thing we can think of? And then we just name it whatever we can name it to ignite uh, the group of people that would, you know, think that the election was a fraud or that there, you know, again, you have the, the vaccination debates. And as Russell said, the, just mentioning these things in K through 12 and in higher ed and in our professional schools, it is, you know, actually teaching about the history and the context, period, because law students learn the law a contextually. They don't learn it. They don't learn it in the context of history or anything else. Like our students, you'd be hard pressed to find a law student who has even looked at the Confederate Constitution or saw it or talked about it. You'd be hard pressed to find a, a law student who has had a really long discussion about slavery and property law or contracts. <laughs> so it's, it's like, you know, it, 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 we have identified, I think, um, multiple battlegrounds and this is where we are right now. And it's the perfect storm with all the things that Russell and Anna have talked about for, for this to happen with this just kind of being this dog whistle, but in actuality, it's about erasure and invisibility. I, mean, I, I think very quickly, white supremacy sensed a threat, right? And exactly what everybody talked about, you know, I got all these things converging. You know, you got midterm elections, you got the summer 2020, you got this piece around nobody really wanting to do diversity, equity, and inclusion anyway. So now here's, a, here's an opportunity to cut folks off at the pass. So now when you think about this particular set of backlash, I mean, this is like the ebb and flow of history when we think about white supremacy and any type of response to any mo any no notion of criticality, and I'll just use the K-12 example to Russell's point, when we saw this 30 years ago with multicultural education, which actually was light, right? So this idea of even having something like that being threatened, CRT is just this, again, it's a straw person because back to Russell's point, see, we know that the majority of CRT is not happening in K-12 spaces. You've got some folks who borrow from it and use it, particularly in ethnic studies, but the real straw person is real, I say the straw person is CRT, but the real thing is 
young people being able to ask questions of their condition. Because here's the fear is when young people ask the question and adults don't have an answer or the answer is something that they do not like, then they shift the curriculum, right? So I think it's really important to put that in our understanding that any time there has been a broad-based movement for justice for people of color, white supremacy moves to attack it. And just to add to what Dave um, said, I yeah, this is such an important question, and I agree that I think there is, um, anytime you attack white nationalism, the pushback is to dismantle any kind of possibility for coal uh, this broad-based coalitional movements. And I think one thing that I would just add is, you know, in the aftermath of the pandemic, I mean, you know, what we saw was something that we already knew, that structural inequalities exist, and the pandemic just, you know, kind of made that even more hyper-visible. And as we start to analyze the roots of those inequalities, then we turn to CRT as a tool for that. And as people start to hear, you know, how powerful that tool is, then there's now the kind of the counter movement to start to dismantle it, to delegitimize it, to erase, you know, the, the kinds of histories that are, you know, necessary for that analysis. And so it kind of, um, you know, became that perfect storm that I think Terry is um, referring to. and. Um, yeah, unfortunately, is it's a storm that is growing and brewing um, in many many spaces. I, I think it's particularly interesting to 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 think about some of the ways that if we look back at some of those founding uh, uh, writings, or some of those uh, you know, those scholars on on CRT, in some ways they you know they they predicted this place that that, that we're in now. Yeah. Um, and I think maybe it'd be sort of useful for uh, for our audience to kind of talk a, a little bit about how CRT kind of predicted what we're seeing, right? That's sort of speaking to this idea of this this long ongoing history of reform, retrenchment, reform, retrenchment. Yeah, and I think what they would get criticized for is they were so pessimistic in their their futuristic assessment. But they were also saying, look, there, you can still have hope if you have, you know, there are many tenements of CRT. But one thing that I took, taken from their early works, is the call for empathy. That if you really want to make the world better, you have to place yourself in someone else's shoes and look at the systemic oppression because you're not the center of the world. And they would stress this in all the writings. Yes, they would debate. I mean, and we have to remember you know, Derek Bell and, and Richard Delgado, they were having fierce debates. They, they, they weren't coming up with tenants on a napkin and, and then going to the bar and having drinks that we solved our problems. No, this was an ongoing debate over years, if not decades. But that the thing of empathy, and I think is so important for my field as a journalist, is to put yourself in other shoes and to reflect. Often, when we have very watered down CRT debates about contemporary issues, the empathy is lacking. So, for example, when a couple of years ago, when the, the, the anti-legislation bill failed, and I was working at the Associated Press, I talked about the history of this bill getting introduced and constantly failing and what that meant, going back to the first lynchings and talking about IDB Wells and Ovita, all everybody else trying to pass this legislation. But in this story, I just put a paragraph to say, don't forget, in the West, Latinos were lynched, and so were Asian Americans. And I put links to actual events. I got so much pushback online that I was promoting, quote, all lynchings matter, that I was taking away black pain. And I thought about it for a while, and I, as I looked at this tweet, what it got is that there was this lack of empathy in this critique, that we know a lot about black pain. We don't know as much as we should, but we know enough to identify it. We don't know about the pain of the others because it's not taught, it's not there. It's only in the academy where we have access to it in certain ethnic studies, and usually it's more graduate level classes. But if that debate is happening there, where did it come from? And to me, that was a legacy of white supremacy and pushing back on this empathy, that you don't have a space to talk about my pain. I'm important, I'm the center, talk about me now and no one else. 
And I think that's something that when we look at early writing and it's being so pessimistic, we have to remember they were throwing clues to say, hey, look, here's how to get out of it. And now we're thinking they were giving us um, a framework to talk about anti-subordinate, to talk about subordination and anti-subordination and to talk about what I call templates for domination so that we can see patterns. So to Russell's point, it's that, I guess I need to know about uh, Latinx pain and Asian pain because they're all happening at the same time in different ways in response to different things. And so it's not just like enslavement's happening in isolation, indigenous removal is happening so that enslavement could happen. It's not just that civil rights is happening in a vacuum, it's that you have these groups starting with um, uh, the, the, you know, the, the children, Asian school children and then Latinx school children who are also fighting for school desegregation prior to Brown v. Board of Education. It's understanding that there's always been shared fights and shared templates for domination. Um, and I think about the pessimism and I think about, um, or the alleged pe pessimism and about um, Derek Bell saying, you know, he believes in the permanence of American racism, right? And people like losing their minds saying, what are you talking about, right? Um, that there's this very different view, a very different narrative of America. Um, but I think that, you know, this is right. It's, it's this kind of ebb and flow. It's what David is talking about, right? That we, what we got with Barack Obama, then we get the backlash with Donald Trump. And now we get something different with Joe Biden, right? But it's the evolution of how white supremacy moves and uh, is shaped and shapes and all of that, that uh, CRT gives us a framework to interrogate. And Derek Bell wrote about his work with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund when he was working on the Brown case and desegregation cases throughout the South. And he talks about when he was talking to a group of black women in the state of Mississippi, I believe it was. And he asked them, you know, you all are dedicated and you all lose a lot. And one of the women in the struggle responded to him. She said, Mr. Bell, my job is to give white people hell while claiming my own humanity. Right. So I think that's the that's that's what we have to think about. Right. So they were Derek Bell, who's Wally assumed to be pessimistic. But what he's saying is racial realism makes you a little more free if you understand what it is that you're in and what it is that you are fighting against, right? And I think this is the, that's the piece that gets folks a little tired because when they hear the term fight, you know, you're thinking about a pandemic, you're thinking about being burnt out, you're thinking about all these things that are really hitting you in all these different ways. But what Derek Bell was putting forward was that the fight, brings the joy because you are also claiming who you are and you are not accepting the narrative of white supremacy on your body. So I think that really becomes important in terms of thinking about how critical race theorists and other critical scholars and other people in movement work called this moment, right? And that is, and then we can even go back to folks like Richard Rorty, right? Who wrote essentially in 1997, a whole piece around Donald Trump before there was all this Trumpism, right? So this thing around all of these folks were actually talking about if we are not careful and if we think things are good, these things will happen. And now we're in this moment where these things are happening. Yes, I, and, and, and I think, you know, part of, part of what we have to sort of think about too is the fact that there are, you know, we can't miss the economic underpinnings of this, right? And the idea that this is really kind of a, you know, we talk about some of these organizations as being grassroots, but, you know, they're really what we call astroturf movements, right? They, they look like they are grassroots, but they're actually being funded from, from elsewhere, right? Um, and so I'm wondering, too, if we can, if, you know, if we can comment on, you know, how this how this particular moment is is tied to this kind of fake uh, 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 economic populism, right? That we we you know this this is coming. You know, tr Trumpism. You know, 
marketed itself as you know as this uh, as this response to the you know to to the the disenfranchisement of of, of of the white working class, despite the socioeconomic origins of the folks who actually stormed the Capitol. That's a story for another time. But what you know what what do we think uh, 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 here in this in, in this regard? What about sort of the economic underpinnings of uh, of this and and where CRT speaks to this? I can say that in covering this issue, one thing that I've seen is if I go to a site or if I talk to folks, they immediately, fo if you say this is largely um, white parents who are going to say, no, 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 we have black and Latino parents. And they usually will bring them out of parade them. One person even said, I can get you a black woman with braids to talk about why she hates CRT. I, I don't know what the braids meant, but that's actually, that was actually cool. I can find you a sister with braids who hates CRT. And what I found was in this, is that it's an aspirational, uh, it's a movement which if one belongs to a mega church or a suburban community and they have aspirations to achieve a certain uh, economic achiever, some sort of economic goals, that they're in this area, in these communities where now this becomes a norm. Now this, if you want to be cool with the cool parents or the cool club, get with this, right? It's almost like they're suburban bebop where they're saying, hey, get with this, just get with, you know, just kind of dig this. Uh, it's it's now a fun thing. And so you see social uh, groups, social organizations, barbecues, social events among this hatred of CRT. And if they explain it well, they say, well, we, we, we like you. What's wrong? You like us. You know, th these are the folks you've left around the hood. Those are the, what they are people that couldn't do what you did. And so now there's this aspirational link that one joins and says, yes. And then the movement then parades these people around. And many times, as we've seen in any context of history, of, of whether it's joining World War II, the promotion of Americanism, that I want to be as American as possible. Now it's a pathway. You want to see how American you are? I'll give you, I'll give you an example. And then they embrace it. And then the movement then parades them around as if spokespeople. And I've seen this in a number of movements. Now, I'm not saying that's illegitimate. But it's happening, and it's a critique of society. And the other, I would say, is in this, this when we're trying to talk about economics, I see a systematic response every time to someone to throw something bone to take our attention off. So I'll see Latinos or Hispanics arguing about this, and someone will say, what about Latinx or Latino? And then they go and debate that corner over here, and about what should I call myself? And this is a debate that frustrates me because I see it every 10 or 15 years and it all has the same effects. It never gets resolved. Our bank accounts don't change. The number of homes that we own rarely uh, transition from where we were. And it's thrown into this thing where it's a cycle. And we don't talk about the poverty, the poverty of South Texas, or the poverty of the Mississippi Delta. It keeps us on this bourgeois argument, so to speak, about what's important when we miss what's really important, which is down the street. And Super quick, this is always getting folks to believe a lie. I remember in their presidential run, Jim Ryan said, the United States is built on a society for equal opportunity for unequal outcomes. And he's telling you literally what this thing is. And now the piece is, to exactly to Russell's point, to get you to believe it. So now what are all the mechanisms to get you to believe in this thing that everybody has the same access to everything and there'll just be some rich folks who are rich and poor folks who are poor and the folks who are rich, it's not their fault, but if the folks are poor, it is their fault, right? So this, this goes right back into the neoliberal play around this idea of if you just submit and assimilate your problems will be taken care of. And we know that's a farce. In fact, what the National Institute of Mental Health has even shown is that people engage in more stress when they try to assimilate and opposed to being having a higher sense of self, right? So this thing around really putting this in the conversation becomes important because we're still getting this argue, argument around and now in the critique of CRT, people are saying, well, isn't this really lo-fi Marxism? And you know, now you all are talking about class and all you want to do is to separate and divide. But the issue is, 
we've never had a conversation around race, class, age, gender, sexual orientation, disability, right? All of these things are kept from us. And now when young people raise up the issue, adults start to, sc- start to scrammer and scam- scram away because they're confronted with a bunch of stuff that they're uncomfortable with talking about. And the funniest one is always, you know, we don't want to make white kids feel bad about themselves. Well, damn, y'all, what has been the experience of young people of color in United States schools since there has been United States schools? I mean, that's the point. That's the absurdity. But goes right back to this class argument. If you do not acquiesce, then it is your fault for your failure. And just to add to Dave's um, point, and I want to pick up on what Teresa Moreno put on the chat about this being a distraction, because I think that is, um, I mean, just to talk a little bit about how um, the Asian American community has been used as a racial wedge, I think it's precisely kind of, you know, built on the economic underpinnings that I think, um, uh, Joseph, you're getting us to think about and that we saw play out in the aftermath of the pandemic, right? When folks starting, you know, started to point out that Asian American communities are also affected by the pandemic, there's a rapid shift to kind of bring back whole discourses around the model minority, discourses around the social mobility of Afri- of Asian Americans, and to again kind of use this strategy of white supremacy that it does very well, which is to pit one group over the other and use one group as a wedge to, you know, kind of you know, move away from the actual issue, which is that there are these structural inequalities that exist that run across um, different communities and that um, that is what we need to deal with and not, you know, uplifting, you know, kind of upholding one particular group as kind of the model, because we know that that is, um, that is one tactic that has been used and continues to be used and it serves as a distraction to, you know, the, the problems that we have and the, the culprit for um, for the suffering that, that we are witnessing. Sorry, I'm so glad you said that, Anna. I was just thinking too, the, the point that you'd made earlier about this kind of, uh, this idea of, of, of exceptionalism, uh, sort of this, you know, the, the, this way to really kind of subvert some of the more kind of critical discussions that we have about Really, the the cross cutting nature of uh, of inequality, right, and the fact that you know it's hard for people to talk about economic inequalities between communities, but also within them as uh, as well, right, um, and sort of recognizing that. Um, I'd like to take a moment and see if there are any questions from our audience. We we you know I I have tons of questions, <laughs> but I certainly don't want to monopolize the entire event. Um, I'm happy to uh, take some questions from our uh, from our audience. Uh, as they may come up. All right. Uh, well, we're waiting to see if there are any uh, hands raised. Um, I can also uh, sort of ask us to to think about, you know, the fact that our our you know our our attention, of course, has been you know tied not only to the domestic but to the global, right? Not only what's happening within our own borders, but you know, but 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 beyond that, and I'm 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 curious um, about what our, our our panelists think. What are you know? What do you think about some of the implications of these struggles that we are having uh, about the the uh, uh, the direction and, and and really sort of interrogating our culture and our institutions? What does this mean for events happening beyond our national borders? You know, we we know that you know globally crises are always overdetermined. And so I think it, you know, it, it's useful to sort of think about, you know, what is, what are the implications of what we're seeing happening within, uh, within the U.S. For, for what's happening abroad? And of course, recognizing the whole larger colonial apparatus, but certainly curious to, to hear your thoughts on that. That's, a, that's an excellent question. Because I keep thinking of the alt-right and white nationalist movements They've been engaging across borders for a while. Um, you see, like the the Bannons, the Steve Bannons, and all engaging with white nationalists in Europe. What I've seen, though, in going to London and France, I don't see us engaging with communities of color as much as we should overseas. We're not really engaging and much, but they are. They know more about us than we know about them. 
So when George Floyd happens, there is a protest in London. There's a protest in Paris. There's a protest in Berlin. And this wakes me up because it shakes me and said, are there, there, are there people from the diaspora in, in Hamburg, Germany? Of course there are, but I just haven't thought of that. They know what's going on here. We have no idea what goes on there. So if a black man is killed in Liverpool, the spot where the slave trade began, we may not get any information about it, right? Maybe through social media, but it's not going to have the same, the same interaction because we don't engage in those spaces now. I think that has changed. And hopefully it will speed up change because now I see those people engaging in conversations. But again, back to what some of the CRT folks said, you have to have a level of empathy. You're not the center of the world. What else is going on in these spaces? And if you go to the Slavery Museum in Liverpool and they talk about it has a whole, it's, it's whole history. It's reclaiming the space where the slave trade began. They talk about everything. They have a specific location for the United States and the civil rights movements there. They're engaged with it. They're, there's a Ku Klux Klan um, outfit that people engage and they're crying with it. There, there's this level of engagement that I wasn't expecting to see. And then you see there was a civil rights movement in, in England, which I had no idea about. And there's even a homage to when uh, Malcolm, uh, Malcolm X came to Europe and was engaging with Asian people from Asia, seeing the racism they faced right before he was assassinated. That woke me up. I wish I had learned about that when I was 18, not 48 or 47 when I went. And I think that we, we talk a lot, a lot about internationalism and trying to build the solidarity. But for us, at least in the journalism space, in the public intellectual space, we have not engaged as much as we should. I mean, to your point, Joseph, look no further than what happened in Ukraine when people were evacuating cities and African and Asian uh, college students were being held at borders, right? We need to understand white supremacy as an international phenomenon, right? And now, to Russell's point, when you look at the lessons of organizations like the Black Panther Party that had an international following, they always reminded folks to connect to the international issues across the diaspora. And I think this really becomes important because the same thing that we're seeing here in the United States is deeply connected to how race is understood in places like Brazil, like France, like England, uh, like Germany, and then this rise of nationalism in places like Hungary, who, where there was just an election where a nationalist leader, a white nationalist leader, gets approved among strongman policies. So now when we think about this in real time, these are the reminders that we're talking about white supremacy as a global phenomenon, not just one that's germane to life in the United States. Absolutely. And I would, I would also just sort of point out, too, thinking about you know, because of making the connection to when you talk about um, uh, journalists and and we look at how this language of, uh, of of white supremacy is is altered and changed in different ways, such that you know it becomes part of this nationalist discourse anywhere, right? If we think about the war that that the wars that are going on against the citizens of nations. You know, I, I immediately, you know, think about what is happening to journalists in the Philippines, what's happening to people who dare to speak out about the ill treatment that 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 different groups of people receive and how, you know, it's dismissed as fake news. It's understood as somehow a viable or or, or useful uh, kind of attack. So it's certainly sort of thinking about those connections. Uh, we have a, con uh, a question from one of our uh, panelists, uh, Ava Mew. Um, and she asks, even though critical race theory won't be discouraged in some states, it doesn't mean that the curriculum will support CRT. And she asks, what are some ways that we can introduce critical race theory in the traditional conservative curriculum? Yeah, I think, and thank you for that question, Ava. I mean, I think the main thing is it's not about trying to proselytize. I don't think it's about trying to proselytize CRT to folks who were rejected anyway. I think the real strength is really having a conversation about how do we support critical engagement of whatever content that we are engaging young people with, 
right? So how do we support people engaging with content, asking critical questions, where the answers aren't necessarily clear and are sometimes muddied, right? So what, what is it, how do we begin to support that space? And I think one of the challenges, if you've been, that if you're in a state like Indiana that has particular challenges, you could say to folks, look, y'all, are we really here about killing the questions of young people? Or are we trying to engage them? So what is education? Or are we just talking about schooling? You coming in, regurgitating whatever the hell I say, and then me giving you a certificate that says you regurgitated whatever the hell I said and graduate, right? I think that thing around really being clear about education is centered in inquiry. And when we kill inquiry, we kill any aspect of learning. And I think that's an important conversation to have with folks because very few people are going to say, we don't want young people to learn. Now, what they will say is, we don't want young people to learn that, right? So this thing around really having that conversation around supporting inquiry, that is the key. Thank you for that. I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, I was just going to add, I think anytime we introduce something that can potentially be identified as controversial, it's good to have allies to support us in that work. And so building, uh, identifying allies, ident identifying advocates who can be part of that conversation so that it isn't a project of just one, one group, one individual. I think that's always helpful, kind of building your own um, community of support and network is helpful. And one of my, and uh, piggybacking what, on what Anna said, you know, one of my students had, one of my brilliant students has a wonderful way of kind of engaging people, which is like to find these shared points on which no one can disagree. So, you know, he says basically like when someone says, well, I don't want to talk about, you know, uh, enslavement. He's like, well, isn't this a project in school about like learning about everybody's history? So you're saying that certain kids can't talk about their history or their grandparents? Like, shouldn't everybody's grandparents be talked about? <laughs> so it's like, oh, wow. You know, if, if I say I don't want everybody's grandparents to be talked about, what does that say about me? Or if I don't want to talk about everybody's history. So um, I think that's kind of like a brilliant framing, right? To kind of figure out like, what are some shared uh, things we could all agree on and then work from there in ways that, uh, you know, may not get people's back up right away. Um, and to be willing to have certain conversations and to exercise grace. You know, I'm not saying that we're going to debate our humanity with each other. That's certainly off the table. But at the same time, um, we, we can kind of engage in conversations um, and facilitate conversations be, that need to happen, that haven't happened in certain spaces, right? Um, so when I was working in the Deep South, you know, it's big, I, this big controversy about Confederate monuments and heritage and not hate. And I had a lot of students who really just wanted to talk about, I want to have this monument because I want to honor you know, my ancestors who fought in the war on the side of the Confederacy because they were military people, but having the conversation about why not everybody may not see it that way and looking out the window and saying, look at this monument. What does that mean to you? Or look at this Confederate flag. What does that mean to you? It doesn't mean the same thing for everybody that sees that. Um, and so I think, you know, again, being able to engage in those difficult conversations um, is necessary. I've always tried, and I've heard these, and I've talked to um, this conservative groups before, and we've talked about Black or Latino history, Asian American history. I always bring up conservative figures in Black history or Latino history, and I'll, and I'll bring up like a Felix Tejerina, who wanted everybody to speak English in the 1950s and wanted everybody to do American. Um, and, and, I, and I'll see conservatives like, oh, I have no problem with that guy. That guy's cool. Like, well, wait a minute. You can't talk about him without talking about John J. Herrera was the opposite. It was saying we need to engage in this black civil rights movement. So you need both. Oh, well, okay, I, I'll, I'll accept those two. So it becomes these small battles of where you can accept, where's the line. And, and I have to say, look, in, in, in integrating us into history, we're not, we're not integrating angels in Jesus Christ. We're integrating people, political beings that had a very complicated history. 
And if you were to take any black newspaper from the 1930s or 40s, you're going to see some very heated debates on how we should, what we should do to fight discrimination and uh, lynching. And those debates continue today. So to say that it, when you're integrating this issue or discussing it, that they're all going to be on the same political page is a farce. And I think that's one of our, um, one of the disservices we do. We had not us on this call, but the, the call, it, and then we get in this space that we're trying to only integrate certain voices. So we're, we want to integrate all voices and see what that debate led to. That everybody loves the Booker T. Uh, du Bois argument, but that was going on for, de for decades before that, uh, even, even those from newly emancipated people. So that's what I always bring up. And I think there's always a pushback. I'll say, yeah, okay, I'm engaged in this space. Because look, we're here today because of the 1619 Project. This was a book that was written that certain folks believe this was a product of CRT, that CRT theorists say, no, it was a work influenced by it, but that's not a principle of work of CRT. And it became accessible to the critiques. That's why there's legislation specifically talking about that book and not talking about Derrick Bell. But I've always found that fascinating. Why go after that book and not Derrick Bell? Because that's if you really wanted to go after CRT, those are the books that you would go after. But that's because it's became accessible, it's become an argument, and it sparked anger for a lot of reasons. Uh, and, it, and to be honest, you brought up, somebody brought up uh, Gerald um, uh, Horn earlier. He was arguing the same thing in his uh, 1776 book, how that wasn't a demarcation of American history, that it wasn't a liberation for everybody. So that wasn't a new theory of what this is arguing, but it became an accessible one. And then that's why everybody got upset. You go after the lowest hanging fruit, and, and, and that seems to be where folks are. All right, so we've got a couple of, of, of questions. Um, so one from our uh, our host, Mark Canuel. Um, I would be happy to cede to Teresa's. I'm really interested in her question. Um, we may not have time to fit in mine as well. And mine, mine is a little bit close to Teresa's anyway, so that's great. Okay, great. Well, we can catch you later then. Okay, so uh, Teresa has asked, uh, so we spent some time today discussing how pessimism is attached to CRT. Um, she says, but I'm wondering if folks have comments on the extreme optimism that CRT can hold, uh, that fighting is inherently an optimistic act. That's a great question. I'd, I'd love to hear people's responses to that. Yeah, I love. Oh. Go ahead, Anna. I'm sorry. No, 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 go ahead, Dave. I'll follow. The and thank you for Teresa, and I and I truly appreciate it because the real work is understanding what are you committed to, who are you connected to, and what is the work that you're willing to do. And CRT, particularly critical race practice, says, "Look, we can't sit on the fence of, of, about this. We know stuff is happening. What are we willing to do?" Right. And I think that that type of sentiment now pushes us to say, if we are not yet free, then what is the push for freedom? How do we dare claim freedom? Right. And that thing around it reminds me of Gwendolyn Brooks when she says blackness is a title and a preoccupation to remind us of the work moving forward. Right. So now when we start to think about this in real time, commitment, CRT is saying, how dare you not fight? And now because we are engaged in that fight, it will be a joyous one because we have made a decision to resist. And I think that's critically important um, in this kind of frame of work. And I'll make sure that Anna. Uh, so I'll, I'll be quiet so Anna can. Oh, you should never be quiet, Dave. <laughs> so I wanted to just say uh, yes, yes, yes to what Dave said, but also I appreciate that question, Teresa, because I think one of the things that um, I always bring up the 1968 strike at San Francisco State, because that was a joyous, you know, albeit um, difficult moment. But I think it was, um, you know, kind of reminds us that CRT is you know, in addition to what Dave articulated, it's a compass and it's a compass for identifying directions for, you know, other, you know, 
for directions for liberation and liberation for, for everybody, for all communities. And so I think it is, and you are right, and I appreciate that you remind us that it is uh, that fighting is an optimistic act and that CRT allows us to fight. And it also gives us the compass to figure out how to fight, where to fight, how to do it, how to build the coalitions, and also how to strategize um, together and collectively. So yeah, thank you for that question. All right, I think we are just about out of time. Um, I am. I think this has been an amazing discussion. Um, I want to let folks know that uh, uh, there will be uh, another panel uh, sponsored by uh, the Department of Black Studies uh, for our uh, annual Grace Holt Lecture, where we will be revisiting uh, some of these issues. So if you didn't get a chance to ask uh, your question about CRT today, you can certainly join us uh, on the uh, 14th. Um, and uh, you can find out more information about that on, uh, on the uh, Black Studies website page. Um, but I guess it, 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 I'm so glad that we ended on this point about, uh, about optimism and about, uh, uh, about thinking, because that was actually one of the questions I was going to, to ask and say, you know, that there, you know, to think about what we can gain, what there are, you know, what the, what the benefits of taking a very so critical, uh, approach to our, to our culture and our institutions can, can yield and moving away from this kind of, you know, tolerance model of, of, of heritage and heroes and, and, and this and actually engaging in a much more vigorous and, and, and useful uh, 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 thinking about, uh, uh, about the world that we inhabit. So um, I'd just like to say thanks to everyone for great comments today. Um, I feel like I'm going to be energized for the rest of the day with, <laughs> with writing and thinking about this. So this is wonderful. Um, and I'd like to thank the uh, Institute for uh, Humanities Research for hosting this and, uh, and giving us an opportunity to, to, to have this discussion.